What is the true nature of reality? And what is the connection between consciousness and spirit? What kind of a world will we live in when there is a total fusion of science and religion? The Bigger Questions series addresses these most fundamental of questions with the help and guidance of some of the scientific community's most brilliant thinkers. The designer of the system allows all these possibilities. What binds consciousness is the tendency of the mechanism of the brain to always present its memory. And so what we have today are very, very different sets of teachings. It's possible without giving up your discerning mind to also be a spiritual person. I think in a sense that, that scientists who get most upset are ignorant. We cannot keep doing for the next thousand years exactly what we've been doing for the last thousand years. There's probably a strong hunger among people to, to have science verify some of their faith. Hi, and welcome back to another edition of the Sedona Scene. I'm Ron James, and with me today is Martin Gray, a man who spent his entire life on a special mission, compiled an incredible body of work. We're going to talk a little bit about it today. Martin, thank you. Thank you for inviting me here, Ron. It's always me, a pleasure uh, to come. Let me pull out this book and show people what we're talking about. This is uh, just published in September 2007, correct? Yep. And who is the publisher for this? Uh, a company called Sterling that's an imprint of Barnes & Noble. This is the uh, largest and most impressive coffee table type color photography book of the year. And uh, Martin spent his entire life putting it together. We're going to look at some of the pictures and talk about some of the stories. Martin, tell us where this all began. For me, it began when I was a young boy. My father was a diplomat. And we moved to India when I was 12 to 16. And I became very interested in photography and archaeology at that point. And then I actually spent about 10 years living in an Indian ashram. And I became very interested in spiritual things. And then I put those sort of together, and I was interested in archaeology and spirituality and photography, and they all came together, and I had this desire to go out and visit pilgrimage shrines and sacred sites all over the world of all these different religions and take photographs of the sites. And so after 24 years in 120 countries, that book came out, and it has actually photographs of about 80 different countries in it of the primary sacred sites and pilgrimage country, shrines of all those different countries. Now, you had this vision that this book would be a reality way back when you started this work, right? I mean, this is almost like you've been following universal instructions almost to do this job. That's very true. In the beginning, there was sort of a directive, a visionary directive that I got to go and visit these sites. And then I thought, well, I'd take a camera along with me. And then after two or three journeys, I looked at the photographs and I thought, these are really beautiful photographs. Why not do this for the entire world? And then my vision became set on, OK, let's compile a photographic atlas of sacred sites around the world. But initially, I'd done it for my own self. I'd just gone out on, on a pilgrimage for my own interest in these sites and for my own spiritual edification. But then once I saw that I took these beautiful pictures, I wanted to share that with other people. And that's why I've done the book. Now, we're going to take a moment and take a look at some of Martin's pictures. You know, Martin, it's no secret that we've known each other for a while, so I'm going to kind of tap into that. You've spoken of these images actually creating like a window to these places, actually capturing their essence in a way that can convey itself to people. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, when I took these photographs, a lot of times I'm standing in a place in a really good position looking at a site, 
And there's a sort of prayer going on in my head, and I'm thinking to spirit of the place, to God, whatever you want to call it, that I recognize very few people will ever be able to visit as many of these sites as I am, or certainly to get into the position that I'm in. So when I'm photographing the places, there's a prayer that I'm saying inside of myself to spirit that let the essence of the, almost the homeopathic essence of the sites come through the photographs to the people. And so I conceptualize or conceive of the photographs, not really as photographs, but as windows, so that when a person is looking at the photograph, they're in a sense looking through the window onto the place and something of the place comes back and touches the person. Because I feel these places have a sort of transformational quality and when human beings e are either at the site or gazing at the site through a photograph, looking through the window, something of the power of the place touches the person. Now how many countries and how many sacred <clears throat> sites have you photographed to date? Well, I've been in around 120 countries and in that book, there's photographs from about 80 different countries. And I'd say there's, in the book, maybe 200 different places, but I've been at over 1,200 of them in 120 different countries. And that took 24 years of travel. And tell us a little bit about the travel. You didn't exactly just hop on a plane and, and go rent a car at your destination and sleep in nice mm -hmm. hotels. This was uh, some pretty interesting uh, methods of getting around. Well, I'm happy to say I've never made a reservation in my life for a hotel. The initial years of my travel were by bicycle. And I went by bicycle because it sort of approximated the rate or the movement or the pace of travel as traditional pilgrims. Um, traditional pilgrims weren't in jumbo jets. They weren't staying in fancy hotels. They moved at a very slow pace and stayed at pilgrims hostels. So what I did is in the beginning I thought, well, let's go by bicycle because we're going to move very slow. And it allowed me also to sort of merge my energies with the, the place. And it allowed me to live like a pilgrim. But then after four or five years of doing it in 30 countries around the world, I thought, this is really slow. I need to speed it up a little bit. So I began going by trains and by buses, still with the pilgrims. And the hotels that I stay in are usually hostels. And there's over 3,000 different hotel rooms I've stayed in that cost under $5 a night. Over 3,000 different hotels. That means 3,000 different places. So I travel on a real budget when I'm going to these places. And another reason that I stay at these inexpensive places is I've often found that the more inexpensive the uh, accommodation, the more interesting people you will meet there. If you stay in a very fancy hotel, you don't have that much communication with the people. And a lot of times they're just they're kind of distant from each other. But when you have a bunch of people staying at a hostel or a youth hostel or a small bed and breakfast, they're very close in with each other and they a lot of times speak different languages and people have been in lots of different countries and there's sort of a, a comradeship, a, a brotherhood that builds up between the people that are staying in the places. I, I've just experienced that a lot. <clears throat> so are you actually working on a follow-up book, The Entire Planet on $75? No, people have asked me to actually write a book on how to travel inexpensively. And I think a lot of people would be interested in that, but I think a lot of people, they don't want to they put up with They wouldn't do a, it. They'd be afraid to travel in those modes and put no, themselves that much and risk. And it's kind of uncomfortable a lot of times. There's probably a strong hunger among people to, to have science verify some of their faith. 